All right, guys. So here we are with the super coach. Uh, well, known, I think your students call you Coach Castoni, right? Is that how you pronounce it, Castoni? Yeah, all well, students sometimes go Castoni, sometimes Castoni. So it that's where you're from. Yeah, right? it's my it's my Spanish. Yeah, my Spanish accent is uh, my Cuban accent is Castoni. But anyways, uh, nice to have you here. And now nah, this is the first of many, I hope. And uh, we wanted to start by just going over the typical questions that our students have. So um, Coach Castoni, he typically teaches. So he, he has a lot of experience teaching students of all levels. And it'll be interesting to get his perspective on the typical questions that beginners and intermediate players have. So, yeah, well... Thank you, first of all, for having me here. It's really a pleasure. So my name is Kestone. I live in Lithuania. That's a very small country in Eastern Lithuania, although I'm traveling really a lot. And for the last, I think, 11 already years, uh, teaching chess has been my full-time job. Now, mainly I work with students that are sub-2000 level, although I have right now a couple of master level students as well, national master, FIDA master. And for the last 11 years, I'm barely playing at all. Like if you see me play five games online per month, that's already <laughs> a good Saturday. So fully dedicated to teaching only. Uh, if it matters, I learned the, the rules when I was just three. My father was a candidate master in Soviet Union. So he taught me some things, later had classes with, with masters and fully dedicated to, to teaching. So I'm very happy, Robert, just to, to share my own experiences. And I'm very curious to, to hear your opinion on the, the same questions. As well. Perfect, man. Perfect. So we have only some time because we have both to go to work. So uh, yeah. the first question that I think we have to address, and even though um, I, don't, I don't like to focus too much on it, but every beginner loves openings. So the first question that I know everyone wants to know is, what openings you recommend for white and black and of course thinking of you know the first openings for beginner intermediate so any opening that you'd like to teach your students or that you like for yourself and of course why that opening over any, anything else i usually first like to teach opening principles because it's so often that people get out of book when they're just beginner to intermediate level players and one of the complaints that we hear all the time as chess coaches that hey he played a move which is not in the perhaps opening book you shared that's not like on the study that you shared so what i usually the, the best advice that i have for students is that the lower your rating is the wider the options you have to look at but you don't have to look as deep so you would look, for example, at seven candidate moves for opponent, but you only learn two, three moves for yourself. Whereas when we're getting to our level, Robert, we have to look at maybe just four moves because the other three are just bad and we would be able to punish them. But we have to perhaps learn 20 moves after each of those moves, exactly. right? But there are certain openings that I think work very well. So for black against E4, I like to teach French or Karakan. Uh, I think E4, E5 for black is very theoretical, although there are coaches who say that it's good to start with that because later... It's too late for you to be developing the feeling for those positions. Against d4, I like also to go with simple queen's gambit decline and, and things like that. And with white, I want to avoid the common uh, systems, unfortunately. If my student comes to plays the London, I will continue teaching him the London, but I pre prefer to, to play something that is a bit more rare. So if it's a system, I would rather teach them some like call a system. Uh, but typically, I just teach e4, d4, depending on what the student's natural character is. And I liked the, the quote of Kasparov, who said something along the lines that your openings and your play of style should represent your character in real life. So if a student, for example, doesn't want to take risks, I wouldn't be uh, teaching him King's Gambit or something like that, right? Exactly. So that would be exactly. a short answer, right? Exactly. That, that's a very good answer. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I'm, the, I'm one of the ones that I learned um, that way, like I just hearing that everyone should start with e4, e5, right? King's pawn openings, double king's pawn opening to get exposure to the open positions. I personally started late. I was like 12th, almost 13th. So I chose to play this uh, Indian setups like the King's Indian defense, the Pierce defense, because I was looking for simplicity, less uh, memorization. That way I could catch up with the middle game and the end game. So I never played e5 myself as black. I never played the Sicilian. So what I did when I started was E4 as white, and that gave me that exposure to the open games whenever they would play five. And then just Pierce defense as black and King's Indian defense against uh, D4. But uh, for my students, I'm, I really tried to teach them E4, E5 first, and then they choose whatever they want to play. Then we just sit down one day, 
hey, look, this is the French, this is the Caroquin, this is the Sicilian, which one do you like? And then they start, of course, I always tell them, you don't have to pretend to learn the first 10, 12 moves of, of every variation, just know where the pieces belong, play it, make mistakes, and then you, you develop a feeling for it. But yeah, I know the Carol Can is, I mean, we know from Karpov's games and many other legends that it's, it's, it's a great opening, but for beginners, I think it's pretty straightforward too. Just C65, strike the center, and just get familiarized with the typical pawn, uh, centers that you could that you could get. So that's a very sound um, setup. And then the London, <laughs> the London, I guess, in the chess community is a uh, it's like a hate love relationship there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I get your point. I get your point, and it helps. It helps since so since everyone plays the London, or not everyone, but since it is so popular. People will know how to handle it, so why not exactly. do something else? So it exactly. makes, makes perfect sense. All right, so the other question that I have here, maybe you had it too, is is there any specific, and we could go, there's a long list, I bet, but if there's one book that you're like, oh, you know what, this is the first book that comes to mind that I liked or that I like to recommend. Yeah, 100% Mastering Chess Strategy by Helstein. I'm probably pronouncing it terribly wrong. I'm sorry if he's watching this video. Right, but the blue one, marketing, uh, sorry, uh, mastering chess strategy, right? Mm -hmm. That would be the, uh, the golden one for me. But I could, I could give 10 more, I think, right? And they're no, all. No, right. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. But no, that's interesting because many times, um, many times we neglect that part of the game. We fall in love with tactics and openings and we neglect strategy. So it's good to have a good book that you're like, you know what, if I go with this book, not only once, because that's another thing, I always tell my mm -hmm. students, you should go over a chess book at least two, three times. Every time you read it, you're going to learn something new. But if you go over that book, you know you're going to have a good foundation, and that's good. Um, yeah. You know, for me, I have to recommend, I've been recommending lately. Actually, I actually have it right here. So this is a book. I don't know if you've seen it. I know this book. I've read it. Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. nice book, man. It's actually, they have like three. And yeah. of course, it's not for everyone. Um, if you're maybe a complete beginner, it's not going to make a lot of sense. But uh, as you get a little bit more experience, uh, they're just showing you games. And for me that I've been lately, also for the last 10 years, I haven't really played a lot of tournaments, but lately I'm playing more local tournaments. And I find this to be very realistic because you are just reviewing the games of uh, Goku and he's telling you, okay, in this position, how would you go? How would you manage your time? How would you create, uh, take the initiative, things like that. And those are the problems that we have in real games more than, oh, find checkmate in three, checkmate in four. That's almost never the, the case. But if I have to recommend one today, that would be the one. But of course, there are so, so, so many. Um, all right, so other than that, I have training plan. Like, do you have any specific uh, structure that you'd like to recommend or not really? I think that it's always individual. So if someone that somebody was just to come to me and ask for a training program, I say I don't do that. But if you force me, I could think of what I would be giving to that student. I just feel that it's very individual. However, I have to say that it's, it's becoming more and more personalized, in my opinion, as you're getting better and better. If I okay. take 10 people for 1000 rating uh, points, say on chess.com, for example, and they were to come to the same class, but I would just prepare class for one of them they would all benefit from it and see that the types of mistakes they're making are very similar. However, if I take perhaps 10 people who are 2000 level or 2200, they would more have different weaknesses. Like one is bad with the technical end games, the other is perhaps lacking in tactics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I think it's about identifying where you're weak and targeting that area instead of trying just to work on everything. It's just, I, I don't like when people, for example, work on just tactics overall if they have problems with something like visualization of course as you solve regular tactics you're going to benefit your visualization skills but then you have better tools and and, and exercises for that like trying to solve blindfold tactics well depending on your level okay. so i like very individual and personalized approach myself and um, that's one of the reasons why i don't create a training program because i believe that those weaknesses are going to be changing every couple of weeks Okay. I've had requests to ask me, create a training program for four months. I'm going to pay you X amount of money. And I say every two weeks, I will analyze your games. I will get new data. And depending on them, I'll be giving you new, new things to, to do. So that's like my approach. And I have a very good feeling that you will agree with my points here. 
Well, you know, I was going to say, here's one of the points that I, I agree in the part in the sense that, yes, it's very personalized. Like most of the students that I teach privately, I just tell them, look, we're going to, I meet you for the first time and I want to know exactly where you are. Because some people come to me and they tell me, I'm 2000 on chess.com, so I know all of this and this. And when I go out, talk to them and I ask them questions, I see that there are gaps. So once I figured that out, yes, we created a training plan that is for them. But I do like to get them on, on a training plan, even though 95%, and maybe this is one of the reasons why you don't like it, 95% of my students, they don't, they don't stick to it. I, I tell them, look, this is what we have to do. And they couldn't care less. They end up playing bullet and, <laughs> and just doing the thing. Right? So that's what I think. But I do believe that if you don't at least have it there written down, the week is going to go by. You look back, you didn't do anything. You just play games, maybe did a few tactics. So I think it helps say, you know what, it's Sunday. Did I review a little bit of end games at least? Nope. Ah, so I have to get back and do that. And yeah, um, I do agree that you have to focus on your weaknesses and so on. But at the same time, um, for me, it's important that regardless of your level, of course, yeah, ignoring the super beginners, but um, regardless of your level, you have to be hitting those areas little by little. Even if your weakness, let's say your weakness is positional chess, like you really struggle to find a weak square and exploit it and things like that. Yes, maybe what we do is in your training plan, we allocate more time for that. But I think it's important that we still hit end game because in my experience, uh, Castoni, what happens is I have had students that they're so talented and they make it, let's say, to 2,000 over the board. But they get there because they're really good at tactics. They're probably better than me at tactics. And when, once they hit 2,000, they hit, a, they hit a plateau. And guess what? The answer to, hit, to break that is end games. You have been ignoring end games all this time. Now you have to focus on it when you could have been little by little just spending one hour a week or maybe a month doing your end games, getting a good foundation. And now it's easier to break through. But now you have to say, let me hold on and really focus on endgame. So I really believe in like everything in life, being balanced, a little bit of everything. But like you said, if this is your weak area, just spend more time on that. But in my, in my opinion, uh, it's important to not neglect any, any of these areas. And there's always something that you don't like to do, and that's another reason for it. Like I, for me, I always hated endgames. I don't know about you, but I found it boring. I remember studying endgames in Cuba that is so hot, always hot. <laughs> and yeah, it's hot, it's noisy, and then starting this end games at noon, it was bad. But uh, we had to do it. And if you don't have someone to push you or at least a training plan to remind you, hey, you have to do at least a little bit, it's easy to just neglect it. And since we don't get them a lot to, it's easy to, to get rid of. But anyways, so I guess your point is don't focus too much on, on, on training plan. For me, I think you, ha you should have it, even if you don't follow it strictly, but I think you should have something there to, to remind you. Yeah, I just want to add that something you said. Of course, like it makes sense to create a training plan once you evaluate a student, right? But you said something that I also very often tell to my students that you're only as good player as your worst move. So it doesn't matter that you could play like 10 moves in a row, like Engine or like Magnus Carlsen, for example. If you play 20 perfect moves and then you blunder queen, you're not a very good player if you're doing this very often. So also different skills in chess, they have different weight on your rating, but you're only as good as your weakest area. And some, exactly. something like tactics, the lower rated you are, the more weight it has. Later, it, you know that at our level, it's more about strategy probably than exactly. tactics. Everybody can see the typical patterns and can calculate, right? But at first, tactics can get you to, like you say, for example, 2,000, and you just get stuck. So the key is usually to elevate your tactics to, say, 1,500, then end games, openings, and all of those other areas to 1,500, and then keep adding. It makes no sense just to elevate tactics to, you know, 2,500 and leave everything behind, right? Exactly. So, exactly. Just keep yeah, that. So. You mentioned a good point. that You said 1,500, and in my experience, that's what happens. Once they reach 1,500, 1,600, to get to 1,800, Many times what we do is we really get a, a, an understanding of the basic endgames. And by basic, I mean king and pawn and the basic rook endgames, like Lucina, Philidor. And mm -hmm. it's not only like uh, reviewing them, but really knowing them, making sure that you can do it by heart. Oh, uh, king and pawn versus king, yeah, I know this. Or uh, opposition, triangulation, you get that under control and it bumps you up to, to 1,700, 1,800 easily. So absolutely. And 
Look, I think to wrap that up, um, we saw that with Carlson. A lot of people tell me, oh, Carlson, when he was uh, in, when he was FIDE master, international master, his games were so entertaining, very tactical. But then all of a sudden they got very boring, quiet, very strategic. And mm -hmm. it's because of that. You get to a point where your opponents are going to say, you know what, I know tactics too. How are you going to beat me? And you have to rely on, on strategy and end games and things like that. So absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, mister. So the other one that I have here that we get this question a lot is how to deal with a losing uh, streak. So you sit down, you have, you have a bad day. Uh, what should people do about it? Yeah, so it happens to every chess player, right? And I think the biggest problem with losing confidence uh, is, is losing confidence about losing streak, right? So then usually your time management is poor because you're doubting your decisions. So, and also very often on the losing streak, you're angry and you're already playing just to get either the confidence back or to get the rating point back. And every chess player knows that you could be even bashing the mouse click just to get the rematch. And the problem with those games is that you're already not trying to play because it's fun to you, but you're just trying to prove to yourself something or get the revenge or get the rating points back. And you're trying to win the games very quickly. You play too actively, you open up positions where, when you're supposed to not do that in the openings. And so you lose. So usually what I do with students is similar thing that I do with children. When I work with children, the most important thing for me is to build their trust. So at first, it doesn't matter how high level the student is, I would be giving that ch child a lot of very easy puzzles. So mate in one, mate in one, mate in two. Then he builds confidence and my trust. Then I start giving him something tougher when he's feeling fully comfortable. So when we as adults, because I saw much, most people or everybody will be adults here, right? It's important to give yourself something easy that you can be solving. And so when a student comes on a losing streak, I give him a bunch of easy tactics. Then he gets his confidence back. Perhaps I will show him how good he can play, even if it's fragments of the games. And I think that's another thing area that I want to pinpoint that we're incapable of playing full game very, very well, but you're capable of playing combinations of four or five moves where you play a strategic brilliance or tactical brilliance, and we should catch those moments and be, be satisfied with that. I would say getting the confidence back by doing something easy, reminding yourself of the good things you do, and perhaps then uh, once you build back the confidence, you're going to be going uh, back on track. Tactics, 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 that is something easy, because I believe it's all about sharpness, and I recommend sometimes going away for a day or two from chess uh, as well. So exactly. detox, it's just detoxication for, for a couple of days, yeah, to clear your mind. Exactly. I think that's, that's right on, right on. Um, focusing more on that, like coming back, I always say, not as specifically as you, say, as you said, but I always tell people, okay, just try to come back into it easily, especially if you come back from a bad tournament. Like for me, I remember coming back from bad tournaments. I, I didn't want to play chess for a week. So then coming mm -hmm. back, start with something easy, whatever you like. It could be solving some tactics, like you said, and so on. But then the, always the main thing that comes to mind when someone asks, I always tell them, uh, just go to sleep. Like we say in Cuba, if you're having a bad day, go to sleep, come back the next day, and you'll be fine. So you just have a bad day sometimes. And then the other thing that I keep repeating is something I, I heard from um, Grandmaster Aviti Gregorian. And he, he gave a very good tip, which is, when are you going to sit down to play chess? Instead of just saying, oh, it's, it's, I put the kids to sleep, let me play some chess. He says, okay, come to play with a number of games in mind. I'm going to play like a tournament. He said to treat it like a tournament. I'm going to play nine games. This is my tournament for tonight or five games or seven games. And then regardless of what happens, you stop playing after you finish that. So even if you lose the last five games, that's it. You cannot play anymore. Your tournament is over. Go do something else. And I think that helps what you said. Uh, oh, I lost five games, let me win one more and then I go to sleep or do one. So if you get rid of that, you're, you stop the bleeding, I guess. You stop the bleeding, come back fresh the next day. All right, mister, I got only two more here. Um, for, uh, one of the other questions that I get a lot, especially from adults, and the question is, what is the best time control to play online? So I play, I'm trying to improve. Should I be playing Blitz? rapid uh longer time controls both none <laughs> i think that um there are diminishing marginal returns where if you play two long time controls i don't like it either unless you're eight or nine hundred plus so people come they're like four hundred level and 
they're being recommended by perhaps other coaches. I don't mind being in the minority with my opinions. I just really will say what I think, right? And that's how it goes. So I don't think it's good to play classical just for 13, 14, 15 hundreds. I think it's about the amount of positions that you could see. And uh, it's better to play four, for example, rapid 15 minute games instead of one classical game. You will expose yourself to more type of positions. And I view games as simply data that you extract to know what are your weaknesses, what kind of positions you're bad in, what you're not comfortable in. It's not all, only about where you make mistakes, but where you're not feeling comfortable. Exactly. Sometimes you could win games, but you're not feeling sure if, if you're doing the right thing. So I recommend 15, 10, or if somebody plays only blitz, then I recommend the 10 minute games. However, with the 10 minute games, I know that it's easier to find games with 10 plus 0. I would recommend 10 plus 5. And my rule is never play without the increment. The story of the increment is very simple. We didn't have electronic clocks. And then we were playing 5 plus 0 or, for example, 15 plus 0. As soon as electronic clocks were developed, every tournament in the world that is like normal rated feed, the tournament has increment. You're right. You're right. If you play Blitz, at least play 3 plus 2. If you play Rapid, 10 plus 5, 15 plus 10. Do, don't play 30 minutes. Don't play 15 plus 0, 5 plus 0. Always have a couple of seconds because you don't want to uh, yeah, be uh, losing a, a winning game clean down. So my no. top is 15 plus 10. But if that's too fast, I recommend that's too slow. I recommend 10 plus 5. Then. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, and yeah, that increment, not only that, it's just that it also allows you to put into practice what you're learning. Like sometimes you have a winning position, like you said, but you don't have time to finish and then you go like crazy, just dropping pieces. So if you have, if you know you have 10 seconds increment and you have, let's say your upper rook, you know how to do the one rook checkmate. So you could slowly, okay, I know this, let me convert this. So uh, absolutely, you have to play with the increment. 15, 10 is what I always recommend, but I always like to tell people, regardless of what you like, blitz or rapid, I think it's important to do a little bit of both. And same thing that I, I said before, just keep a balance. If you just prefer rapid, well, you could have one day a week where you play some bull, some blitz. Mm -hmm. Maybe 5-5, five, five. doesn't have to be 3-2. Or if you, like most of my students, they just like to play blitz, 3-2 or 5-5. Or five, five. Well, you have to find a day in the week where you could sit down and play at least one or two rapid games. And 15-10, I think is a good, it's a solid number. Because you get time to think about strategy and position of chess and calculate, but you also get the exposure to time pressure. So you're going to get into time pressure. So I think we agree on that, definitely. And then last question that I have here, and this one is another good one for more advanced players, is any tournament tips in general, like as preparation or when you're ready there, after? Yeah, so first of all, I've heard so many tips from different coaches that uh, now it's hard to choose which ones are correct ones, which ones are not correct. For example, what, what do you do? Like, what do you do? Yeah. So first of all, for me, it's a very important to build up confidence and tactical shape. These are two most important things when you're about to play a tournament. So how do you do that? First of all, you solve a bunch of very easy tactics on the day of the tournament before the games in the morning. So this, like for example. If I don't care what's your rating on chess.com. You go to custom puzzles and you select a rating range of say 500 to 1000 and you solve 30, 40 tactics in a row as soon, uh, as fast as you can. So this will give you confidence because bam, you win, bam, you win, bam, you win, bam, you win. And what I believe is that brain subconsciously, you enter this winner's mindset as you're solving a lot of them in a the row. And then tactical shape. So this is of course, when you're very close to the tournament. If we're speaking about, for example, weeks or months, then it's preparation of everything, like the opening repertoire and all that. So I think that if you're an advanced player, then building up opening repertoire, just preparing for that game as well is very important. So one of the things that people forget to do is if they play a much stronger opponent, if you're playing IMs, GMs, is see what they play against weaker players. And a lot of the times me and my students were able to guess. Uh, he's playing for perhaps... Petrov against uh, other grandmasters, but he's not going to play Petrov against you, the okay. Russian is known in the East part of the world, right? He's going to play something like Sicilian against you. So I would say three tips, like uh, opening preparation, we uh, can deal with that. That's a very vast question. We can talk about that for, for hours, but I believe getting into a tactical shape, so doing a lot of easy tactics and building up your confidence with, with that. So this would be a couple of uh, very important tips. And psychologically, 
uh, it's a win-win scenario because if you lose, then you know what you need to be working on. So exactly. usually with children, I say, go out and lose all your games. It's ridiculous, but I really take the pressure off them. I say, exactly. go out and lose all your games. If you win all games, I don't know how to make you better because you're making all good moves, right? So then they usually win a lot more, right? Because they don't have <laughs> That's the pressure. That's a good one. That's a good mistake. one. Yeah. So I say, go out and lose all of your games. Get, give me a zero out of nine, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, no, that's, that's a good one. You know, the, you gave a good tip that I've heard from many good coaches and, and players, which is solving tactics before the game, like easy tactics, like many one and things like that. Now, that's one point that I wanted to say. I I do the opposite. I, I really believed in the opposite. And maybe it's because of the way that I was, mm -hmm. uh, that we were instructed. When I was in mm -hmm. Cuba, um, I'm, with, I'm talking about 2004, 2005, that I started mm -hmm. to play uh, local tournaments. Our coaches, when we would go to, let's say, national competitions, mm -hmm. we were, uh, it was um, prohibited to do anything chess related during the tournament. Like, you were not supposed to play blitz. Like, we love to play with, like, we'll get together with people from other states and uh, we just wanted to play blitz. And if you were caught playing blitz, you, you wouldn't be allowed to play the tournament anymore. Like, <laughs> so, you were not allowed to do that. You were not allowed to we were told not to do anything chess related, don't solve tactics, don't review openings. So the mindset was, at least for my coach, once we get to the side of the tournament, watch a movie, play soccer, but don't do anything chess related. You go to a game, you get out, we're not, we're not going to analyze it, just uh, do something else. But uh, today, I think that has changed because number one, it's important what you said, do some tactics for the game to warm up and get your mindset. But also today you have the ability to prepare against your opponents like every tournament that i go to people are before the round preparing they send this the pairing and they go on their phones oh i'm playing uh Kestony. let me see what he plays oh i see he plays sicilian so let me prepare something and people that's what they do and everyone tells you to do that i still prefer to just chill chill don't do anything if you've been training you've been preparing all this time you should trust that and, and play it but i know i'm on the wrong side here because everyone that i hear they say the same thing you said also, I don't like before the game to do tactics because in my mind, I'm just, maybe it's just me. I feel like I'm going to get tired. Like if I do 40 back to back, I'm already, I'm going to get to the board a little bit. I prefer to just go there, relax, have a good night of sleep, have a good breakfast, relax. But uh, again, it's, that's only me. Everyone else that I talk to, they say the same thing. Um, in, investigate where your opponent plays, do a few easy tactics before the game. So that's the way to go for whoever is watching. Um, but I guess, I guess it's, just, and also look, um, I always say for me, even if I knew what my opponent was doing, I'm going to play the same thing. That's the only thing. Like I play the same <laughs> openings. <laughs> so regardless, I'm going to do the same thing. There's no point. By the way, my coach used to tell me the same thing, uh, not to play anything, uh, or don't do any tactics for three days before the tournament. And it was more perhaps so that we would miss chess and we'll be excited about playing. So he yeah. had that approach. I think for me, it works better. And if I did play, of course, it would work better if I was warming myself up. I know this from online games that if I decide to play, um, I, I always tell students a very interesting thing. It's related somewhat to not all of my students are playing the tournaments. And I think not all of your students are also playing the tournaments, right? Because okay. it's more like serious and all that. So, but I think the same preparation that works for online chess, it should apply for the, for the tournaments as well. So when we're doing something like, for example, puzzle rush, let's say, right? And on average, let's say your score is 25 in five minutes. You're, I don't know what, what rating you should be to hit that, but usually you go from 20 to 29. 29 is your all time highest score. So what I tell my students is that you want to be playing games when you're at your top 25% or 30%. So if you saw puzzle rush and it's 21, don't play 22, 24, 26, 27, then you go and play. So I believe that the tactical shape, it fluctuates and it differs uh, from day to day. And it's so easy to get yourself into the sharp mindset, spend 10, 20 minutes on tactic. And I believe that you, if that player scores 28 on puzzle rush, and then he plays only one with that score, he's going to be 100 points higher than if he scored 21 in puzzle rush. I believe that it's massive difference. That's a correlation. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very good point, actually. That, that's a very good point. Yeah, because that, that shape of yours or form, it, it always differs and you sort of want to perform when you're in your peak. And it's very easy to test it. You just do puzzle rush and you know, 
and it's also very easy to get into into better shape. Well, do pu five puzzle rushes. I bet that your first car is gonna be worse than uh, the last three. Like I no, bet. You're right. Yeah. You're right. I, I just yeah. remembered. I just remembered. I just remembered. But you know, that's I, I, that's an interesting thought. Uh, use that as a measurement before getting in, before yeah. getting into the water. <laughs> See yeah. how you are. Yeah. No, I was yeah. here. Um, I I read somewhere in a book that the author i don't remember what book or what author but he was saying how he had a training partner and they loved he said he's like not everyone should do it but they love to before doing any training just playing some blitz games and he was saying that they like to do it to get into the spirit of you know getting a, you know getting mm. warmed up and getting aggressive and competitive mm. so he said maybe it doesn't work for everyone but for us it was great to just start the training session with a blitz game and get into that competitive mindset and then get on the board and really train for two, three, four hours. So that's, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Okay. So I think this was great. Um, we have a lot of other things that we wanted to do, like play some games and do like uh, brain and mouse and, and, and things like that. Uh, brain and mouse, brain and mouth. But, um, yeah. but basically this is just the first of many other meetings. Uh, of course I'm going to leave uh, coach Keston's information in the description. That way you guys can, uh, check out his other content a lot of great videos on your channel uh, also if you have any questions or maybe coaching inquiries you could contact him as well and let's hope to do this again yeah this is awesome thank you very much robert it's been you a got pleasure it, you got it